world is the forecaster. And Martin Armstrong, of course, has armstrongeconomics.com. He is a former political prisoner. He began his studies into market behavior when he first became fascinated by the events during the crash of 66. He became one of the very first to begin forecasting currencies. He began creating a global model in the mid-70s and was published the results about 72. By 85, Armstrong was certainly one of the top premier foreign exchange analysts in the world. And he was cited in the Wall Street Journal, you name it. Armstrong is the developer of economic uh, confidence model based on business cycles. And then it goes over uh, all of that and the different predictions he made about different crashes and the different tops of markets and things like that. And I wanted to get him on to speak about what was currently happening in the world the move by big banks to get rid of cash, uh, what he sees with China moving to start dumping uh, so-called U.S. treasuries, and the fact that what is illegal and was denied until a few years ago is now admitted that worldwide currency rates are being rigged by insiders, uh, that worldwide stock markets are being rigged, that interest rates, LIBOR is only part of it, are being rigged. And that only a select few get to act on that insider trading knowledge. If they catch a low-level person acting on insider trading, say you work at a company, you know, a merger is coming in two months. You think that merger is probably going to lower the price of the stock. You go ahead and sell it. Well, that's just common sense what somebody do. But no, that's insider trading. We're going to put you in prison for that for $5,000, $20,000. We'll put Martha Stewart in for a couple hundred thousand dollars. But then the big boys do it every day. So there's so many places to go with uh, Armstrong, Martin Armstrong. He was on before, loved having him as a guest, really informed fellow. I could ask a lot of questions here, Mr. Armstrong, but where do you think we should start with this whole cornucopia of craziness happening? I mean, am I wrong in saying, do you agree that we're really entering a more volatile time where things are compacted and we're about to see a lot of uh, economic and political and military action? Yeah, the next four years is basically really going to be pretty bad. Um, it's all coming to a head at this stage in the game. And, and the biggest problem people don't realize is that it is, it's really debt driven. And what that means is that if you look at the national debt, 70% of it is accumulative interest. So, you know, it didn't even create a socialist agenda, you know, helping people or anything of the nature, although that's the greatest, you know, sales pitch that they always say. But, it, you know, when you look at it, it the money's going out the back door. And so you know, the, the debt crisis is really driving everything because governments know that they're starting to lose power. And as they lose power, then you're, you're looking at this, eliminating, you know, cash, um, all this is basically designed to get more taxes. You know, rather than reform the system and say, hey, you know, something's really screwed up here. Um, no, they just try to hold on to it. And I mean, the, the media doesn't really tell the truth about much of anything. Um, I really laugh when you see Hillary Clinton trying to pretend she's really for the poor and all this sort of stuff. And then she goes and rents a house on the beach for 150 grand, but uh, for two weeks, no less. <clears throat> but it was the Clintons that that started this mess. They repealed Glass-Steagall and allowed the banks to start proprietary trading. And that really profoundly changed the banking system. It's created transactional banking. It's not what a lot of people you know, think. You they know, just trade uh, money back and forth to each other and charge each other fees. Yeah, I mean, it's basically before banks would, what they would do is, you know, if I was a banker, I would lend you money for your start of business. But I would, you know, there was a relationship. I would come down, make sure you're doing okay, et cetera. When Clinton repealed Glass-Eagle, the, the argument to do so was that if they could start trading, then that would make the banking system more secure because they wouldn't risk um, if there was a, an economic decline or, or failures, et cetera. So what they did 
with the 07 and the, C, you know, and the, and the mortgage-backed securities. They started packaging this stuff and then reselling it. So it became transactional uh, banking rather than relationship. So I no longer care really what happens to you. As long as it looks good on paper, hey, and I got somebody else who will buy it, I'll lend you money and I sell it to somebody else. If you default, that's their problem. So we were in this period of, of really where the banks are no longer what they used to be. And um, it, it's really causing a tremendous problem. The, the second thing that, uh, that the Clintons did was effectively, you know, he stood up and said, oh, well, okay, they signed in the, you know, the uh, Education Act, and they're going to make it more affordable. So they said they were going to lower interest rates for students. But what they didn't tell you was that they, you know, out the back door again, what they did with the bankers, they cut a deal and they made that students cannot even get rid of the what they owe on in bankruptcy. I mean, you can go bankrupt on just about everything, but student loans. So it's having a major impact in the sense that you're seeing marriages are declining dramatically because kids can't afford uh, to, to really get married. And, uh, you know, with a high debt from student loans, they can't even get a mortgage. So it's really, it's, it's having a real serious impact uh, across the board. And, uh, well, when you look at the United Nations, money. sure. When you look at the United Nations and you look at Agenda 21 and the post growth period and the plan to reduce, uh, savings so that people are too poor to have children, there really is a method of the madness, and the establishment, of course, basically exempts themselves from what they're foisting on the American people. And you're right, watching Hillary Clinton, uh, just in a clip I played earlier, say that they should ban basically all the guns and confiscate them like Australia, she goes on to say how she's fighting the big banks, too big to fail, and the mortgages and everything. When she was there with her husband and Larry Summers and all the rest of the folks who literally did this, as you were just saying, put all this in place so they could have unlimited free money themselves and then give us basically the debt. It's, it's just so crazy to watch the bipartisan elites do this. I don't see how they think they're ever going to get away with this. I mean, what a plan they've developed. Uh, you've been pretty accurate at predicting not just economic moves, but social moves. There's two different articles today, one in the New York Post, one in RT, saying America's due for a revolution. Do you think they've bit off more than they can chew? Because they've expanded derivatives, as you know, since 2008. Uh, they have really consolidated the economy. And then the ultra-rich have the, the gall to then push social change movements that push class envy to try to start some weird wealth redistribution move from the middle class to poor. Uh, so a type of bait and switch. Where do you see all this going? It's, you know, effectively, you know, the whole system is just really collapsing because of debt. And, and that's really what the, is driving everything. They can't sustain this. Uh, so... Uh, I don't see it, you know, lasting very much longer. I mean, I, you know, we have offices in Beijing and and, and Abu Dhabi and around Europe, etc. And I travel all over the place. I was just in Greece for the for their last elections. Everywhere I go, people are very angry at career politicians. That's really what's coming down. So uh, I see this as a worldwide, you know, problem and a trend. And you're seeing it more in Europe right now because they feel the pain first. And eventually it will come here. You're seeing it in Japan. In Japan, they call it the celibacy syndrome. The kids aren't even, aren't even dating, no less getting married. And uh, in Canada, you had the finance minister. He came out and actually said that, uh, well, they, they should work for free just to get experience while they're living in the basement of their parents. Um, I mean, this is a joke. I mean, in Europe, you have unemployment among the youth about 60%. They call it the lost generation. So we're heading towards major civil unrest. And 
this is what revolution is really about. It, it comes around about right on a cycle about every 300 years. And, um, you know, we asked for it, I think, honestly, because we're too complacent. We just allow the politicians to do whatever they want. We believe whatever they say. And, you know, the media just, honestly, uh, it just gets to be really ridiculous. Um, I mean, even if you look at my my case in, in the movie, they put a little clip on there from um, Bloomberg News when they were trying to do it. Everybody said, gee, you know, that I was all over the press. I've been erased. You go to Bloomberg terminals. I don't show up. But we used to publish on there. So um, it's really kind of a joke that the, the producers of the film couldn't find anything. And they finally found that clip on the Wayback Machine. And then they went to Bloomberg and said, hey, well, we found something you said doesn't exist. And so they had to allow them to put it in the movie. But it's, it, you know, Gretchen Morganson put me on the front page of the New York Times saying, what's going on? What's going on here? Right Stay there. Again. Absolutely. Martin Armstrong, a man put into the memory hole. And if they can put one man in, they can put every man and woman into the memory hole. It's Big Brother 2.0. We got callers all over the map, and I know our guests can speak to it. That's coming up in the next segment. This headline just went up on Infowars.com. Russians threatened to shoot down Israeli aircraft. Israelis allegedly attempt to spy on Russian ships and aircraft in Syria. Allegedly, it's all admitted everybody spies on each other. An Arab language news network in Iran reports Russian fighter jets intercepted Israeli aircraft on an espionage mission near the Syrian border Sunday. Al Alam quoted the Israeli daily as saying the Russians forced the Israeli aircraft to change course after they were detected with radar. The Russians blocked the Israeli aircraft while flying over the Akar region of northern Lebanon and sent a warning they would open fire if they violated the Syrian airspace. Well, we know that's been happening with U.S. aircraft as well. It's really sad to see our government on the side of the jihadis over there. I'm not lionizing Russia, as I've said a thousand times probably, but Russia is defending its national interest. We are there destroying our national interest. We've got uh, Armstrong Economics head, Martin Armstrong on, uh, famous uh, predictor of trends. Uh, they made a major film about him, and the response of the establishment was he didn't exist. And, of course, the film gets into all that. Uh, just amazing the type of stuff that they pull then they were able to interview a lot of the big Wall Street heavies about what had happened. Um, let's get back to your film and your case because that's a window into all this. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. We can get into the world economy and where you see it going. But for folks that don't know, it's important for, for them to know what happened to you in a nutshell. Well, effectively, I, I don't entirely know um, because... <clears throat> Our computer does, a, it's a, it's monitoring the entire world on a capital flow basis. And uh, it has done amazing forecasting as far as war is concerned. I didn't quite understand it at first, but we had uh, the Lebanese, Universal Bank of Lebanon had found a, uh, a journal in their basement with the Lebanese pound back to the mid 1800s. So they asked us if we could create a model. I said, sure, you know, we put it in and what it does, it correlates absolutely that market with everything in the world. And it came back and it said that, you know, their currency was going to collapse in eight days, which I was very shocked. And I called the client, but the, the clients pay me to, for what does the computer say? Not what I say. So, I told them, I said, you know, the says you got eight days. And the client said to me, he says, okay, what currency do you think is best? Which I thought was really shocking because I thought I just delivered a major forecast, with which I thought was nuts. And then I saw it, it, it did the same thing. Eight days later, the Lebanese war began. Uh, then it did the same thing with Iran-Iraq war. Um, and then finally, I began to understand, you know, watching it for about 20 years. So we, we saw 150, you know, uh, billion coming out of Russia with only 100 billion going in. 
we stood up in you know in uh, 